You're listening to the Jay and Dan podcast presented by our good friends at Coors Light. We will take a poll. Dance. Dance. It's the week of October 8th, 2018. It was 30 degrees. Watching the baseball game in Cleveland today, it was 30 degrees there. Yeah, it was 28 in Pittsburgh yesterday for the football game. And it's going to be, I think it's going to be 28 and 27 the next two days in Toronto. Wow, look at 27 that. and 26, according to CP24, your number one source for news in Toronto at well, the dentist's waiting office. <laughs> Hope everyone's uh, full of turkey. You know what? This is the first year in, I think, my lifetime I didn't have any turkey. Did you miss it? Yes, because yeah. my favorite part is the turkey sandwiches mm-hmm. the next day. Yeah, they are great. We, so I guess you should explain why no turkey this year. Uh, my mom sent out a text to me and my siblings. She said, uh, no Why don't you wants- pick up the slack, you no, she's Something like, like that, or am I paraphrasing? She's like, guys, how about this? No one wants to do a big cleanup. Um, I'll just host a, a Thanksgiving breakfast on Saturday. And then we're all like, done, in. So what? Is in the Thanksgiving breakfast. Oh, bacon and eggs and such. No turkey. Still got to clean it up, though. That's yeah, a quick cleanup. Men <laughs> really feed my mouth. Couldn't you guys have stepped up and, and, and cooked the turkey together? You, your sis, your, your brothers. Well, I was just talking to Spring, our makeup artist. They deep fried their turkey. Mm. took 45 minutes. That seems to be the way to go. Yeah, uh, last year when we were at the Argos Rough Riders game, the Jay and Dan day mm-hmm. at the BMO Field, if you'll recall, uh, at the tailgate, which they don't do anymore. I wish they did. That was a lot of fun. It was. They, uh, were, there was a guy who was deep frying a turkey at the tailgate, and it was delicious. Come on, it'll be Every fun. Every time I see one of those, though, I'm like, someone's going to get seriously injured. Probably at a tailgate. It seems inevitable. Yeah, because that hot boiling grease just tips over. It's bye-bye toes. Your buddy, comedian Cat Williams, arrested on suspicion of assaulting a hired driver. That sounds like something you'd do. Cat Williams is a funny guy, but assault against a driver, not funny. Not good. Uh, we cooked our barbecue. Wee! <laughs> sounded like uh, Ned Beatty and Deliverance there. Wee! <laughs> Squeal like a pig. Wee! <laughs> Sorry. It's a disturbing movie. If you haven't seen it, you should, though. A classic. Burt Bur- Reynolds. Burt Reynolds is amazing in it. Uh, John Voight is amazing. It's a great film. It's just very tough to sit through that one scene. Anyway, uh, we barbecued it. Uh, on so, the grill, indirect heat, of yeah. course. So essentially, so you it's put it in the middle, right? You got it. And then, uh, yeah, you put the both sides on low to medium. Well, actually, we, we have a we had it pretty high. We we have a small barbecue. It's just the three burners, so it's perfect for it. Yeah. And uh, we had it on the old three seventy five, three seventy five for two and a half hours. It came out absolutely amazing, crust, delicious. Did you baste it the whole time? No, not once. That's the oh. thing. I didn't baste it once. I should have. I know you're supposed to do that, but I kind of forgot. I just left it in there. I barely lifted the lid. It could have been a disaster, but it was perfect. And uh, what'd you what'd you have with the turkey? Every all the usual uh, stuff. Nothing uh, nothing crazy. What could get up that hole? No, we ha- we didn't put anything up the hole. My mother-in-law makes uh, stuffing with sausage. She makes sausage. It's like a kind of a Chinese thing, I guess. And she. Uh, she doesn't like to stuff it in the hole. My mother-in-law doesn't like to stuff things in the hole because uh, it's kind of messy. I kind of find yeah. that gross, kind of. Yeah, it is. You know what I mean? Like, Where is the banana hot dog? Rather than stuffing things in the hole, she puts it in a nice uh, roasting pan. She makes it. It's delicious. Oh, it was fantastic. And we had a very special guest for, uh, for Thanksgiving dinner. Producer Tim oh, came over. Wow. Producer Tim was there. Did he behave himself? He was on his best behavior. Hmm. Uh, only went out for maybe five darts. <laughs> and actually didn't go out for a dart until after dinner was over. I know smokers, you know, the smoke after the meal is the big thing, right? That's their. That's one of the reasons people keep smoking so long. I think it's... I, I don't know. I've just heard this. I've never smoked. Yeah. But... Um, I don't understand that, because you'd be full, and then you'd be full of smoke. I'm not sure. There's something about a a cigarette after a meal, apparently, for smokers. I'd love to hear from some of you smoking fans out there. Some of you dart pals, our dart pals. (laughs) Hashtag dart (laughs) dart pals. Uh, That's just a faction of our uh, listenership. We'd like to hear from (laughs) Jay and Dan dart pals about why 
why this cigarette after a meal is so uh, so exciting for you. But yeah, it was a great time. And then um, and my brother-in-law came over and we had a great time. But uh, then later, and I know you watch this too, you were going to come over to our place and watch, but it's too yeah. late. Got tied up in Peterborough. Yeah, too late and a long way to come. Mm-hmm. And they do start the UFCs uh, pretty late. Yes, very late. I get it. I, I know it's in Vegas and everything, but but it's really, really late. Like by the time Connor and Habib started fighting, it was like twelve forty or something like that. Correct. So that seems tough to <laughs> if you're trying to grab a new audience. It's like what time's your event? Forty minutes after midnight the next day. <laughs> Tune in. What? So, so I'm sorry? What? Yeah, but it was a great pay per view. I will say that all the fights were compelling. And we're going to have our good friend and MMA reporting legend Ariel Hawani on the show. He is. He has turned himself, and we've had him on the old Fox podcast, the 2.0 version. He is the Bob McKenzie of the UFC. That's right. He's the guy who breaks the news. He was breaking so much news. Dana booted him for a little while out of the events. <laughs> That's right. Dana White did. And then the backlash was so uproarious that Dana had to say, okay. He had right. to he had to walk it back a little bit on that one. Just as he will walk it back on the on all his declarations, like, you know, that he made after the Habib jumped out of the octagon. I don't know if he'll ever fight again. It's like, yeah, okay. Who is the guy who had the uh the post fight interview that's now Derek uh Lewis taking the world is by it Derek Lewis? I think it is. Yeah. Can you confirm that? Uh, Ariel tweeted out today that since that interview and since his fight. Because we're, t- he, we're talking about the, the big guy, right? Yeah. I think he, he what's beats his a Russian. nickname? It's something, it's something that I want to make sure I get right before I say it. Um, but he gained, since that fight, 500 and some odd thousand Twitter followers. Yeah, because I don't know if that many people knew. But there was a lot of things happening there. Like, first of all, the first fight was that karate hottie. That was a pretty good fight. She all, won. All the undercards, everything were great. Let me see if I can find his name. That Derek Lewis, all that rush. Derek Lewis, what's his nickname? Black Beast. There it is, the Black Beast. There you go. He was hilarious because it in that first round, it looked like his eye, he, the Russian guy had poked his eye or something. He couldn't even see it. That he was going to lose. And then all that Russian guy had to do is just run for the last 20 seconds. Just run around the ring like a... Hamster on a wheel. That Russian guy before the Didn't fight, he Got was like popped. the happiest guy on the earth. He wouldn't stop smiling. I'm yeah. like, you're about to get your head punched in. He, he was doing great. He, he would have won. He would have won. It was his fight. But uh, yeah, the Black Beast was pretty, pretty funny in that post fight interview. He wants to go on Joe Rogan's podcast and smoke some weed with him. Hey, Derek Lewis, if you're listening, <laughs> if you want to come on this podcast and do that with us, as of October, uh, was it 17th? 17th? We can all do that legally. Hello. I still don't know where. There's no stores set up. Nothing. Absolutely. Know. Orono. There's one store, and it's in Orono, next to Dan's house. <laughs> in, at the old. It's in my basement. At the old CIBC. Hey, um, wanted to give a, a shout-out Friday night. I was in Peterborough preparing uh, to go for breakfast at my mom's. I knew I had to get up early. It was 11 wait, o'clock. Wait, 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 what? <laughs> That Friday night, I was in Peter, Peterborough preparing to go for breakfast. Yes, because I, I get stressed out over having to wake up early. I don't plan anything before noon. Nothing. Mm. So I looked. I'm like, oh, I'll go see a band tonight. So I saw a band was playing named Choir, Choir, Choir. Have you ever heard of these guys? Yeah. So it's it's not like a band, right? It's like it's just a collection of people, isn't it? Like, well, it's a guy who conducts... <laughs> So this is what happened. So I see this, and I'm like, ah. It says they play, like, uh, current hits and all that. I'm like, I'm going to go see a choir, play all these songs. This is going to be great. Uh, Two people. What? Two people? (laughs) Yeah, it's just because the crowd is the choir. Exactly. Right. Yeah. (laughs) I really need to start reading and researching before. So you thought you were going to see a choir. (laughs) Times three. (laughs) Anyway, it was great. You're like, it's three choirs. It's not just one. They taught us how to sing Hallelujah all together. <coughs> then we sang uh, Summer of 69, Ahead by a Century. We should have the guy who started that on. Like, it's a Canadian thing. There's two thing. of them, yeah. They sang the uh, O Canada at the Grey Cup last year. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I knew they did something at the AGO. 
And I, yeah, there were just like hundreds of people there singing. So classic moment. We go in, me and my lady friend, and we're sitting at the very back. It's at the Market Hall in Peterborough. Beautiful theater. So I'm like, we'll just sit back and watch. We're just going <coughs> to. The guys come out on stage. Excuse they're me. like, uh, all right, welcome everybody. Hey, what are you guys too cool for school up there? I'm like, uh, what? Oh, boy, you got called out. One time. of the guys came down from the stage. He's like, you're coming up here. I'm like, no ah, way. I don't, I don't want to. And so you went on the stage? <laughs> no, no. They brought us down to the uh, the floor seating. <laughs> so wait, were you like the only people up on the like the second level on the mezzanine? We were at the very back row, like underneath the audio booth, just because we wanted to observe. Wow. Okay. And the one guy's like, "Hey, I know you." I'm like, "Ah, da. where do I know you from?" I'm like, "Ah." I, I, I hate when people say that. <laughs> I, I, if you don't know for sure, don't. Come up to and us and say, And then people were yelling, he's from Where do TSN. I know you from? And then the guy's like, ah, I don't get TSN. Never mind. So <laughs> then they continue. I'm like, thank God. But I get that a lot now. Where do I know you from? And you expect me to fill in the blanks for you? And I knew one person there, my cousin Daryl. Uh, they started singing a song. They stopped the first song. Oh, boy. Mid-song. They said, someone's singing way too loud. Oh, no. And trying to be, like, in key. Who is it? And everyone points at a guy. It's my cousin, Daryl. Nice. Way to go, Daryl. They called him out the entire concert. Wow. I'm like, what is happening? Wait, so they kept stopping it? <laughs> yes. They're like, Daryl, we need to hear a lot less Daryl. Hey, Daryl, shut the <laughs> up. <laughs> That's the shut same. the up, Daryl. We're trying to sing a song in Peterborough. <laughs> you, Daryl. <laughs> you and you're on key, it's Daryl O'Toole. And then, <laughs> was, his last name's not O'Toole. Okay. I um, imagine that. So, as I usually do, I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, the 35 bucks a seat. How many people are in here? They made some good coin in there. I, they're a thing. Like, people know about them. Yeah. Clearly, so, we don't know the exact details. Again, it would be cool to have the, the main guy on there to talk about how he browbeat you into coming down from your perch. So, choir, choir, choir. Talk Great. to him about Daryl. They're... <laughs> They're doing a great job. I'll get their... The one guy's name is Nobu. Um, <laughs> Nobu? Like yeah. the restaurant? <laughs> it is. Um, here it is. Okay. Group was founded by David Goldman and Nobu Adelman. Oh, Nobu Adelman. Good guy. So there you go. In 2011. So they've been around for a while. So if you want a fun night out where you have to sing, everyone has to sing or else they call you out. Mm. So... Uh, it's pretty good. You know what is unfortunate tonight? You and I could have gone to see gorillas tonight. Gorillas. You like those cats? Damon Albarn from Blur? Do they still play behind a screen? I don't know how the concert works exactly, but they're playing the ACC tonight. And our friend Ben Buchanan, uh, who uh, may be involved with us uh, hopefully touring the country someday with the podcast, he uh, represents them, and he was like, hey, you know, you guys, you and Dan want to come down? And I was like, oh, we're going to Is that where producer tonight. Tim is? Because he's not working tonight. Well, that's kind of what I was wondering. Like, maybe <laughs> maybe producer Tim's a big a big Gorillas fan. But he usually only takes nights off to go see the Foo Fighters, It right? is true. That's the one band he goes to. Yesterday, he was like, before I left, you know that thing where we finish the show and everyone just wants to get the hell out of there? Like, when, when the show's over, it's a race <laughs> to the parking lot. It's like, it, it's it's like NASCAR. It's it, Talladega getting out of here. It's like if you watch The Amazing Race <laughs> and the very beginning, you know, where Probst or or John Montgomery's like, go, or no, Pro, I guess Probst is Survivor. Anyway, whoever says go, and then it's just like chaos. That's us leaving the show. And I'm like getting ready to leave. Everyone's gone. And Tim's like, oh, wait, wait. Did you see uh, Foo Fighters? uh <laughs> Did a show in California over the weekend, and they did it uh, chronologically. I'm like, oh, cool. And then I like it. He's like, so what they did was <laughs> they uh, they started with the first album. We had five okay, hours. I get he could have before the show. We had five hours. I'm like, I get it. I get it, Tim. I get. It. And then they went to the second <laughs> album. They did some songs off that. Yeah, but Tim, I, I really want to go. I'm not feeling great. I want to go. Yeah. And then they got to the third album. And uh, and then they did some Nirvana tunes. And then here's the tunes they did. I'm like, oh my god. Meanwhile, everyone else is home. Oh, they're absolutely <laughs> G-Bone, our other producer, is already, he's on, he's on the 401, he's ripping down. G so G-Bone is producing tonight. 
Yes, it's going to be a uh, clean show. It's going to be super clean. Everyone will get along. Tim will be there. be no tension. Yeah. Every time we do a segment, G-Bone comes on. He says, you know what, guys? That was a great segment. He's so positive after a segment is over. He literally has never said a negative, well, maybe the odd negative thing. But very (laughs) few times does he say anything negative. Hey, speaking of the show last night, um, I really messed up. You mentioned how uh, the Kings made a Budai call. Peter yeah. Budai. They called him up. I said, also, oh, Homer Simpson's back. He's got Ned Flanders on his mask. Oh, right, Yeah, it was a major right. mess up. I really apologize to all the Simpsons fans. I really have oh, that one. Oh, yeah, that's right. So sorry about that. Does someone else have Homer on their mask? No. I saw that John Gibbons of the Anaheim Ducks has a, a Guy Bear tribute mask. Ooh, I like that. He's wearing right now. Guy Bear is part of the Ducks uh, Broadcast crew, I believe his nickname is Frenchie. Frenchie. Our friend Julie Stewart Binks used to uh, used to be on that broadcast crew. Mm-hmm. Now Binks, he's just cruising around, doing Instagram stories, improv, all sorts of fun stuff. We'll have to check back in with her soon. Should we give Ariel a call? Let's do it. Let's uh, give Ariel Hawani a call. I can't wait because he was at this event. Yeah. And- if you witnessed it, you've seen the highlights by now because it's been, they even showed it on the CTV National News last night. Yeah, the chaos, the aftermath, which is what makes me think it's all that they're upset about it. I agree. Dana sees that. Of course, it looks bad. All but in the back of his about, mind, he's like, that just sold me a million more pay per views. All he's worried about in the moment is please, no civilians get hurt. No civilians Correct. get hurt. That, that would be bad. That would absolutely be bad. But as soon as he confirms that's not happened, then it's smooth sailing, I think, right? Then he's Mm -hmm. loving it because it's the tension's been amped up for the next one, and it's just wild. Like, the fact that they had, you could hear him uh, on the mic saying, I can't put this belt on you because this place might start throwing stuff at at you. They did throw a few things uh, when he almost was out of the arena. It was pretty, it was pretty fun. And the guy I want to talk to Ariel about is this Tony Ferguson guy. He was insane. Yeah. He was psychotic. Get him in the ring or in the octagon with those two guys. Not at the same time. That wouldn't be (laughs) fair. But I'd like to see Tony against Habib and Tony against Connor. A lot of people will be mad if Connor gets immediate rematch. I don't think so. Really? Do you think people care that much? No, I mean other fighters. Other fighters will be. Oh, for sure. Other fighters will be. But yeah, no, the fans want to see that. Yeah, they have to understand. I mean. Did you and I really pay that much attention to UFC pay-per-views until this past pay-per-view? Hadn't been for a while. The last one I really cared about was DC's yeah. heavyweight one against Stipe. I tried to order that one, and I, it oh. didn't work out. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Anyway. It's unfortunate. Sounds like uh, Ariel's just, uh, we're having a hard time getting a hold of him, but we will get a hold of him in just a second. I, can I just mention, so it was, it was the karate hottie fight at first. That was interesting. Mm-hmm. I do love that the UFC, it's like, if a female fighter like Ronda, right, becomes big, she can headline the whole thing. I, lo- I love that, mm-hmm. how it's an equal opportunity sport. So they're really pushing the karate hottie, just like they pushed. I was talking to producer Tim about that. Paige Van Zant. remember we had her on the old Fox Sports Live show. She was super nice. And she was also on Dancing with the Stars. On Dancing with the Stars. Beautiful woman, but not a great fighter. Like, they really want another She did Ronda. have that one knockout where she did the flying... Knee, but I think she lost like, like everything after Superman that. kick. I think they call. Like it. she, I don't think she's won for. I don't know. For, I don't even know if she's still doing it anymore. Anyway, her and then Derek Lewis, which was wild, and then Ovin Saint Pru fought, which was yeah okay. Remember him? I was oh, telling yeah. everyone that I was watching the pay per view with when we, we interviewed him. <laughs> that's right. So when you do an interview uh, on our on your show and fighters appear via satellite. You get to see all the lead-up interviews that they're doing with people. You're like in line. We would, we often would go last because yeah. we never would want to come in early. And we don't want to. And we want to see what other questions have been asked. We don't want to keep repeating questions. Ovens was yawning <laughs> in between <laughs> interviews. He He's does not know how to chill. sell a fight. He's um, very chill. We've got Ariel on the phone now. Ariel, are you back from Vegas? Yes, I had nachos in my mouth. Sorry about that. I wasn't expecting you to come to me so soon. Oh, listen, do you want to finish the nachos and call us back? <laughs> no, no. It was mid-question. Mid I was like, oh, no. This I, is horrible. Did you make nachos uh, in the oven or just nachos and salsa? You just dip in them in salsa? 
Well, if, if, if you must know, I ordered them yesterday. Now they're like day old nachos, so they're very soggy. They're not very good. It's not a very glamorous life that I lead here. What? Wait, wait, wait. You ordered nachos a day ago and you're still eating the nachos? Errol, you have this fantastic uh, new gig with ESPN. Everything's yeah. going great yeah. for you. You the, day old, the days of day old nachos, those are over for you. You think so? I don't know. I have three children. There's not much time to make anything, so you know, I just have to... I just have to do what I can, you know what I mean? I understand. I understand. Hey, congratulations on the new ESPN deal. Have, have, have things changed for you? I, I didn't realize. I was you know watching the pay-per-view over the weekend, and I saw that FS1 still has the post-fight show. So the, the new ESPN deal kicks in in the new year. Is that correct? That's correct. It kicks in uh, 2019, January 1st to be exact. Now, when you say have things changed, what are you referring to? Well, you know, I mean... You you did some stuff with us at Fox. We were lucky enough yeah. to have you on. Like, you know, working with ESPN, Have you've already kind of started doing stuff. You've got your show, your podcast on. New set looks great. Your set looks fantastic. Uh, uh, big differences between the two companies that you notice? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the first one, if, if I'm being honest, is I just feel a lot more support at ESPN. Um, Been there. You know, working, working at Fox was a learning experience. And I met some great people. My good man, Zeus, who I think you guys know. Oh, yeah. Love that guy. What a guy. <laughs> was still one of my favorite uh, people in the world uh, till this day. And so there were some experiences that I'll, you know, I'll never forget. But overall, I would be lying if I said that it was a positive experience. It certainly ended on a very sour note. And I wasn't sure. You know, there's not that many opportunities when you're covering MMA to be on TV. And so for this opportunity to come about, and then for me to sign before they even had a deal with the UFC, and now they're going to be the broadcast home of the UFC, um, is, is kind of surreal. Like, I didn't plan this. People thought that I planned this and that I was trying to recreate the Fox job. I didn't plan this at all. Um, and so once, you know, once they let go of me for reasons that you know, had nothing to do with me, I didn't do anything wrong. It was, it was Dana telling Fox to get rid of me. Um, you know, it was a bummer. You know, you, you have a dream, and, and, and then that dream is gone. So I'm very thankful that, you know, ESPN has given me this opportunity that, you know, they're, they're, they're very loyal. They have my back. And thus far, I've met some really great people. I've only been there a little less than four months, but thus far, I, I can't complain. Can you imagine, Ariel, like Gary Bettman going to, like, Stu Johnson, the president of TSN, and saying, you know what, uh, I don't like what Bob McKenzie's reporting about this league, I want. Yeah. You know, I want him out of there. Like it's actually amazing to think that 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 actually happened. <laughs> well, well, you know what's more amazing? I mean, I'm not amazed that he would make the suggestion or throw out the idea. I'm amazed at how quickly they jumped. You know, he said jump, they said how high, and uh, I mean, I worked for them for five years, and I got a two minute phone call. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. Um, to, to to give you to 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 let you know like how weird that is. I was uh, supposed to work for them last summer at Showtime, and the president, Stephen Espinoza, asked me to meet with him. And, uh, you know, I met with him an hour before we were supposed to do a show from the Staples Center, and he said, you know, I, I hate to say this to you, but, um, you know, Dana created a big stink, and uh, you can't work for us. You know, we're kind of partners. And, you know, I was very upset. I had just flown cross-country and all this stuff. But what, you know, stood out for me the most and what meant the most to me was the fact that this guy, who I'd technically not worked for for a second yet, I was just about to, actually took the time to meet with me face-to-face and was, you know, very um, compassionate. And that was, I didn't get anything like that from Fox. So mm. that yeah, that's... kind of highlighted how sort of sour the uh, the experience ended for me. Hmm. That's but when unfortunate. All that, when all that came out, the outpouring that uh, you received online, that must have felt good. Yes. I mean, uh, if I'm being honest, I'd rather not go through it. Um, but, yes, the fans have always had my back. And, you know, it's funny because when I went to ESPN, that's a big change for people. There's, there's, you know, there's differences, right? And I have been, I was at my previous job, so I had an Internet job and a TV job. The TV job was Fox for many years, but I also worked for Vox Media, um, VOX, for nine years. And they got really used to the same coverage and the, 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 the coverage was delivered to them in the same way and it was all free and international and, and now things are a little different. And the fans got really mad and, and I'm the kind of person who feels very guilty about that because the fans have always had my back. And, um, you know, it's, it, so that's been a bit of a transition for me because, you know, I, I see people writing like, you know, Canadians, 
I can't get you on ESPN, and, and sometimes it's geo-blocked and things like that, and that breaks my heart because I feel like I actually work for the people. At the end of the day, because they have helped me so much and they've had my back through thick and thin, and I've, I've put them through a lot, there's no doubt about it, um, I, I feel guilty about that stuff, but I'm confident over time that you know this will be a good move for everyone. Okay, let's dive into uh, McGregor and Habib. Is the UFC and Dana, are they really that upset about what occurred at the end? Look, I, I, I don't think that they wanted that to happen, and I think that they took all the necessary precautions to avoid something like that happening. But the whole routine afterward, uh, you know, the, the sad dad routine, I'm disappointed, all that stuff, you know, I, I just I have a hard time buying it because in April we said this is the most disgusting thing in the history of the sport and all this stuff, and then two days later that stance softened, yeah. and then it was used to sell the fight. Yeah. So I, I'm just having a hard time, you know, in the moment, as I'm watching it, I'm in the arena, it's, it's hard to watch. It's, 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 it's somewhat frightening. It reminded me of Andrew Galata versus Riddick Bowe, that, that famous boxing match yep. where chairs were being thrown. It, it is a scary thing, and I know how deeply personal this, this feud is. And I will admit also it's somewhat heartbreaking because I love the sport of MMA, and I know that so many people were watching, you know, new fans, the eyes of the sports world were on, you know, Las Vegas and the Octagon, and, you know, you want the sport to be represented in the best way possible, and up until the very end of the fight, I thought it was, and then that happens. But now, 48 hours later, no one was seriously hurt, no one was arrested. You start to think to yourself, well, this thing, you know, is really a six-month build from what happened in Brooklyn to, you know, all the, the trash talk and, and, and family being talked about and religion being talked about and, and the kind of letting Connor do what he does. Um, there's, there's, there's no way that you could be surprised that this happened. And I can guarantee you, regardless of what they're saying about it now, if they do the rematch, which I believe at some point they will do the rematch, this footage will be used time and again. Thousand percent. So I'm not really buying, you know, the the whole this was a horrible thing. The one thing I said, we were watching the pay per view at my house, and I someone said, well, you know, doesn't Habib understand that you know you're selling the fight and you're trash talking? I'm like, no, no, the, he's Russian. It's just different. It's just different, and he's Muslim, and it's 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 religion, and it's a cultural thing. And he held it in so tightly, right? Like even at the pre-fight press conferences, you said it to us on our TV show. You know, you got a little more out of Habib and the press conference where he was by himself. But when he was with Connor, he's just not going to engage him that way. That's just not who he is. When it was all over, you just saw that rage come out. You know, like when he submitted him, you know, usually guys are just celebrating. They're not sort of, you know, getting in the other guy's face that they just submitted because there's sort of a code about that. But it just wasn't that way with Habib. I thought he was not ever going to let go. I thought he was just going to choke him out until he was completely out. Yeah, I was actually surprised that he showed that kind of restraint. And and then you saw him say something to Connor, And then, of course, everything ensued. Um, But no, look, I I am not of um, Muslim descent. I'm Jewish. But I do think that there are a lot of similarities between the two religions. Of course, there's a long history there. And so I understand why Habib feels the way he does. Um, Habib still lives at home with his parents. He has two children. He is married. He still ha- that's, how, that's, that, that's the culture. The youngest child in the family lives at home. And his dad, he speaks about his dad in, in the most glowing way. I mean, he, he, he is everything to, 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 to Habib, his father. And when, when, when this thing started to turn towards there, that territory, family, religion, stuff like that, I knew that Habib would not react, um, you know, the way he typically reacts, which he's, you know, he's, he's unflappable, he's stoic. Even telling me a week before the fight that this is personal, that is a surprise for Habib to say. Uh, and so that's why I think we shouldn't be surprised. And that's why I think the UFC does deserve some credit. They were prepared for this. They did everything they could do. Um, to stop something like this from really spilling over. I think they were lucky that the crowd was predominantly pro Connor. I think if it was like a 50-50 type of crowd, this thing could have turned into a major brawl in the stands, like that Bo Galata fight. Yeah. But the problem was, when he jumped out of the cage, everyone forgot about Connor, and that left him open to being attacked. And that's, you know, I understand where Habib is coming from, and, and he lost his cool, okay, no harm, no foul, whatever you want to say. But for guys on Khabib's team to light up Connor like that after he was just in a fight, to me, is disgusting. Yeah. It shows you the uh, the differences in the two camps today. Um, 
your colleague and our friend Arash Markazi uh, from ESPN, he tweeted a picture today. He was in the airport leaving Las Vegas the same time as Habib, and he said maybe two people stopped him for a picture because he was, he was just by himself. If that was Connor going through the airport, there would be hundreds of people. It just you could not get two more polar opposites. Yes, but I will say, um, and, and I, I, I tweeted this video from a journalist in, in Russia, um, Habib is now back home in Dagestan, and he filled a soccer stadium that holds around 20,000 people for this homecoming ceremony that they did wow. for him, and there's, a, there's footage of the people rushing towards him. He is, I mean, he, he is a megastar back home in, in Dagestan and, and, and Russia. Well, Putin so, called him, didn't he? Yeah, Putin, and, and that's interesting in its own right, because... Uh, Vladimir Putin um, invited Connor to attend the World Cup on his behalf, and he took a picture with him in the you know the World Cup final in in um, in, in Russia, and and he took a picture with Putin and, and and Habib was at the game as well and did not take a picture with him hmm. and you know without getting too deep into it and I've I've learned a lot more about it um, in the build up to this fight but the relationship between Vladimir Putin and the Dagestani people is not good. Um, and that's being kind. And so people thought that this was a calculated move on mm. Connor's part to sort of stick it to Habib. And so for Habib to then get the call and to be praised by Putin, and that's why he mentioned it. He said, oh, I heard the media saying a lot of things about, you know, Putin taking a picture of them. Well, he just called me. Um, I thought, uh, you know, that was, that was a big moment for him and, and, and shows just how deeply personal this fight was. How much did the UFC need... Uh, this high profile of a pay-per-view, in your opinion. Because for Dan and I, you know, we thought that the UFC really did need it. We we hadn't been too engaged in the UFC, to be honest, since the Cormier-Stipe uh, pay-per-view. Do you think, am I overstating that, Ariel, or or do you think the UFC needed something like this? No, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it's imperative that they have Conor back um, coming off a win or coming off a loss. He's the biggest star in the history of the sport. Uh, he's, he's, in my opinion, top 10 most famous athletes in the world right now. And so they really need, you know, even if it's him fighting once a year, they need him. And, and to not have him fight for two years, almost 23 months to be exact, is, is a blow to them. Now, they made a lot of money off of the uh, Mayweather fight. There's no doubt about that. But for the brand and to have him on a card, and then you can highlight either other fighters on that card as well and try to make stars. Derek Lewis is a perfect example <laughs> of that. Uh, he, he gained 600,000 followers on Instagram um, just based off of his performance and his post-fight interview. That's what they need. And so, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, since the uh, sale of the company, there have been you know few and far between nights like we had on on Saturday, and so that's why if you think that these guys are going to be reprimanded, if they're going to get stripped, it's not it's not going to happen. I, I I appreciate that they have to say those things, but one thing that drives me nuts is when people try to compare Dana White to Gary Bettman or Roger Goodell or or Adam Silver. He is not the commissioner of the sport. He is not even the commissioner of the UFC. He is an owner. And an owner is going to always side with his biggest stars. He is not in the business of trying to take those guys off of you know the roster and trying to reprimand them. So people need to stop thinking that he is uh, you know some commissioner who's there to you know uh, bring down justice on these people. Like you know when David Stern suspended Ron Artest for 73 games, it's just not going to happen. So if they schedule a rematch between Connor and Habib, does Dana have to deal with an uprising within the UFC? No, I don't think so. I no, think people will understand? Score. Yeah, everyone knows the score. I mean, I think it's a bit of a tough sell if they do it immediately, but honestly, nothing would surprise me with the UFC these days. I mean, I think the UFC, you know, they're kind of finding their way, and they go through ups and downs, and it's a cyclical sport, as are all combat sports. You know, people say one day boxing is dead, and then boxing is on fire. So, you know, they, they, they one of the unspoken things, I guess you could put it, is, you know, they have a... Uh, a massive loan with a lot of interest, and they, they sold the company for $4.025 billion, and it wasn't all cash, if you get what I'm saying. So they have to do what's best for business, and they have to do you know, what makes them the most money. Uh, that being said, I do think it might be a little soon to do it right away, and of course we have to find out what happens with Nevada. Nevada could you know, issue some kind of suspension slash fine on Habib, uh, but I have no doubt at some point down the line, Connor gets what he wants, and he wants the rematch. And uh, I have no doubt that they're going to oblige at some point. Watching the fight, though, uh, and people talked about this, you know, stylistic nightmare for Connor. It, everything that people said Habib was going to be able to do it to him, he did to him. 
even to the point, Ariel, where he was standing up with him in the center of the octagon and trading blows with him. And, you know, you heard John Anik and, and Joe and those guys say, you know, what's he doing? Well, it, it didn't seem to affect him. He's, you know, he seemed to be fine trading blows with him. So do you think Connor can actually beat this guy? I, I think a lot of people, um, including my colleague Chel Sonnen, who you guys may remember, uh, thought that Connor did better than expected. Um, and I would, you know, to a degree, agree with those people, considering the layoff, considering the fact that Habib's strengths are, are Connor's weaknesses, and, and, and those are wrestling and his cardio. Um, but at the end of the day, I had it, you know, three rounds to one. If we're going to include the fourth round as one of those rounds, uh, I thought Connor won the third very, you know, very, very closely. Uh, that's notable because Habib in the UFC has never lost a round, so that's the first time that he's ever lost a round. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're 100% right. Uh, he stood in there, he took his shots, and he was giving him back. And in fact, he he dropped Connor um, ever so briefly with, you know, strikes on the feet. So uh, I thought I thought it was a flawless performance by Habib, and in the end. Connor has won some fights before fights with his trash talk, with his mental warfare, most notably against the likes of Jose Aldo and Eddie Alvarez. Those guys were done before the fight started. In this case, now looking back, we were wondering how would he respond to all this. It's very clear that Khabib responded positively, that this lit a fire under him and that he brought his A game. He's 27-0 now, so he's a legit fighter. I would argue he's top two, top three best fighters in the world, period, and on his way to being the best lightweight of all time. But he certainly, you know, he certainly rose to the occasion, and that's very notable because he's never been on a stage like that before. Now, I know there wasn't a uh, knockout in the Connor fight, but in all the prelims, did they set a record for huh. amount of knockouts? Uh, no, they didn't, but it was, uh, like I said, it, it, you know, as far as finishes and whatnot, um, it was up there. I don't think that they set a knockout. There's a couple of cards that come to mind that I know had more, but uh, it was, like I said, one of those nights where the eyes of, of the sports world, at least, are watching, and, you know, this was a card that was actually somewhat maligned because people thought that they should put bigger names on the card. Well, the reason they didn't put bigger names on the card is because big names cost a lot of money, and it costs a hell of a lot of money to have Connor on the card. So you need mm. to be able to be strategic with how you divide that money. Um, but they were strategic in putting the right kind of fighters, exciting fighters, young fighters, people that they want to invest in and, and, and give this platform to. And I thought for the most part, the majority of them rose to the occasion. So that was really cool to see. And I think that there are some people now that if you watch that fight, you know, the card, the whole card on Saturday, you're like, oh, I want to see that person as well. That's always been the brilliance of the UFC. It's not just about the main event. They try to hook you with the main event, but really, you know, they want you to see everyone else so that they can build future stars. Um, and and up until the melee, uh, I thought it was a phenomenal night for the sport. I Okay, I know we're, we're keeping you longer than I promised, but I have to no ask you, going, continuing with that theme, Ariel, you know, Karate Hottie does great. Derek Lewis wins. That's all good. But Tony Ferguson, my yeah. God, this guy. Like, I'm just watching him. I'm like, he's relentless. Like, this guy's incredible. Does he ever get tired? How is he not a bigger star? And as you pointed out, obviously they want him to be a bigger star, and it couldn't have worked out better for him. Uh, unfortunate way that ended because it was such a great fight. Um, but and you got to love how tough Pettis is. But, man, that was fantastic to watch how relentless that guy is. Yeah, he's um, he's an incredible fighter. He has an 11 fight winning streak um, right now. It's active, and his story is somewhat tragic in the sense that he, you know, someone with a winning streak that long and 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 they haven't fought for a belt yet. I mean, that's just absurd. But he's been, uh, you know, he's been he's been saddled with some bad luck because Connor has been in his division and he hasn't been very active. And then they had to move on, and he actually got an interim title fight back in October of last year and won the belt. So all is well and good. He finally gets that, that, that gold around his waist, but it was the interim belt. So it wasn't the official title, but still it, it, it helps him get more money. Um, then he's booked to fight Habib in this great fight that they've tried to book a couple of times before, uh, and the fight fell through for, for various reasons, injuries um, on, on both sides of the equation. And we're, we're finally there. Everyone can't wait for the fight. A week before the fight, he's at Fox your former home in L.A., and he trips over a cord, a camera cord, and tears his MCL. 
literally a week before the fight, he's out there promoting the fight, trips over a court, tears his knee, and is out of the fight on a week's notice. Um, and then gets surgery, comes back in five months, and does what he, what he did on Saturday, but he doesn't have the belt. They stripped him of that title, which I yep. thought was unfair. Doesn't have the belt. And so now he has to work his way back up, and he's, he's back being the number one contender. So I hope him being on that card in the co-main event, that's why I said it's a little premature for the rematch, I hope he gets Habib and they do that fight once and for all. The God, amount of blood in that so fight great. was graphic. It was. <laughs> It was incredible. It was an amazing yeah. fight by both guys, I thought. Yeah. I really thought they both brought it, and they had an opportunity to, you know, I think Anthony kind of came away as a bigger star as well, even though he lost. Do, um, Max Holloway, before we let you go, yeah. you know, where, where do we stand with Max? How's he doing? He's, he's, about to, he's about to be in another pay-per-view up here in Canada. Yes, uh, December 8th, to be exact, in Toronto at the Scotiabank Centre, I believe <laughs> it's called now, right? Yeah. That's right. That's it. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's good to have him back. Uh, it, it was very worrisome what happened to him. In case your listeners don't know, uh, he was supposed to fight in July on the same card as Cormier and Miocic on uh, July 7th, I do believe, to be exact. And he was pulled from the card just like three, four days prior um, due to what they called concussion-like symptoms. But they did a bunch of tests, and they couldn't find what was wrong with him. He was slurring his words. Very scary stuff. He's had a very tough year. In fact, he was the guy who they tapped to replace Tony Ferguson on a week's notice against Khabib yep. in April, and he missed weight. And so he hasn't fought yet this year um, after coming off one of the best years of his career last year. Uh, so I'm looking forward to having him back. That fight against Brian Ortega is tremendous. I hope it stays intact. Uh, they had a co-main event fight on that card as well, Joanny on Jacek against Valentina Shevchenko for the 125 title, but they canceled it to try to salvage the New York card coming up on November, so I feel bad for the Canadian uh, fans and the Toronto fans in particular. But your Maple Leafs are doing so well, I don't feel so bad uh, because it seems like everything's, you know, uh, as far as what's most important to you, Torontonians, is, uh, is going well. well what what about your Habs? They look, no. uh, everyone us underestimated your Habs. They look pretty good to start the season. Uh, uh, they do this from time to time. It'll be like a good November, a good December. <laughs> and then, you know, they're doing a fantastic job of wasting Carey Price's prime years away. I mean, it's just phenomenal. It's great. Oh, uh, I don't it. know. I don't know about that. The, hey, listen, uh, uh, Bergevin looks like he's totally in control in between. <laughs> he looks like he could fight in the UFC right yeah. now. He's so it's jacked. Tech. The only person who has pecs more impressive than Mark Bergeron. You know what I'm going to say, right? Yeah. Am I allowed oh, yeah. to say this? Because I noticed it got cut off from the interview. Is, that, is this taboo, what I'm about to say? No, 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 no not at all. The interview went too long. We, had, we, okay. that was, we blame producer Tim for all these things. Um, well, I just have to say, Darren Detition has <laughs> one of the all-time great physiques that I've ever seen in my life. First of all, a, a, a gem of a human being, smiling, just so happy to be there, a real joie de vivre. And I've only met him twice. Once at Mayweather McGregor, once at this fight, and I have to say, it was like seeing an old friend from high school. So happy, smile on his face, just, 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 just thrilled to be there. But he is just busting out of that suit, and it's yeah. all muscle. I mean, it's so impressive. He tells me he's 50 years old, I think, and like three kids who are in their 20s. The guy looks like he's 25. I can't believe it. You said Mark Bergevin looks like he's in control. I've never heard those two words. You know, <laughs> no, no, what, no. He looks like he's well. He looks jacked. Like, he, like I think he's forgotten about the team and he's just in the gold yeah. gym and in, uh, in old Montreal or something like that. Good for him. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Listen, Ariel, this has been awesome. We really you on. appreciate it, buddy. Uh, Anytime. I love it, you guys. And it's such an honor to be on your show. I, I didn't even like, I was working so much in Vegas, I, didn't, I forgot to tell my friends, and, you know, back home in Montreal, and I got so many texts. Like, I, I, I do all this stuff for ESPN. No one cares. Back home. <laughs> I'm on your show. And they're like, oh my God, you're on J&J. We saw you singing, reunited. Like, wow, I should just move back home to, to, to Montreal or Toronto, and, yes, and you people should. actually care about what I do. Well, why don't you do that? I mean, you can, co- you can come work here. We've got tons of studio space. Everyone. Work da- or move down to much music, so we got lots of room up here for you. Is this buddy. an offer? Oh yeah, big time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't have money to pay you, but oh. uh, but but bring the family up, free health care up here, so that's something. Yes. You're interesting me. My wife <laughs> tries to get me to move back home every day. To be honest. So. <laughs> well, I'll listen. Let, I'll let her know what your offer is, and then we'll uh, we'll take it from there. And we'll, we'll see you at the fight in December. Oh yes, yes, absolutely, one hundred percent. Ariel, this has been awesome. Enjoy those uh, day old nachos, and we'll talk to you <laughs> soon. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Take Anytime. care. Ariel Helwani. What a guy. Great a Canadian. A great Canadian, indeed. That was fun, chatting about all that stuff. Um, Hope you guys enjoyed it. Yeah, he is uh, a pleasure to work with. He's um, he. We've discussed this before. He literally created his own job. Yeah, that's by right. reporting on the UFC. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, we're going to try squeeze Webby in here. We uh, Webby's been waiting.
Oh, uh, okay. So, um, friend of the uh, podcast, uh, Steve Webb, former New York Islander, now works for the NHLPA, just returned from the, what did they call this this trip? Should we call him next? I feel bad. Should we call him next week and go longer with him? Because I feel like we got lots of things to talk to him about. I think we should. We'll ask him. <laughs> Can we call him next week? Can we get him on and say, can we call you next week? This will be entertaining if we just tell him that. This will save me having to text him here. Uh, (laughs) Is he on the phone? Okay, we got him. Webby? Webby? You there? Webby? Gentlemen. How are you? We're doing well, thank you. How are you guys doing? Our last Great. interview ran long, so this is going to be short. Should we call you back next week, or should we just bang this out? I don't care. Whatever you guys want to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's your show. <laughs> it is our show, yeah. Um, okay, why don't we do that then? Okay, we're going to call you next week, but uh, you got back because we wanted to talk to you because you're over in Europe for uh, for all the NHL stuff happening. Yeah, you were in uh, you're in Germany, you're in Sweden, uh, and you sent me uh, videos from those games in Germany. Those fans are nuts. Yeah, the uh, the fans are unreal. Like I wish we could bring that a little bit of that over to the North American fans. Get those. Uh, you know, towels going, all the scars, the the chants. You know, it's pretty impressive. What? Why don't? Why can't we get it going here, Webby? Is it? Is it just alcohol? We we're not drinking enough. I don't know. Well, the Germany game is different. It was a it was a holiday that day. The game was at four o'clock, so I don't know. If people are out and about throughout the streets um, early in the day, but they could have been. Yeah, but if you go to a four o'clock game in Ottawa, you don't get people waving flags and stuff. Yeah, no, I don't know how I don't know how you introduce that. You know what I mean? In that that environment again. Listen, we have, you know, we have the you know with Vegas coming in and what Nashville's been doing. Those you know two entertainment cities are pretty bringing it strong. And maybe it's going to get contagious, but it, it is definitely different um, in Europe with how they actually uh, show their appreciation for the uh, for the game and what's going on. So it's pretty N- impressive to watch. Were the NHLers superstars over there or just? Uh... Did they just blend in? Oh, yeah. No, no, they're definitely superstars. And there's a lot of people over there as well that uh, flew over directly for the game. But, yeah, definitely. But I also think the, the fans are loyal to their, to their local club. And they wanted to just uh, compete with those guys. Well, and, you know like, I mean? they wanted, you know, no, sorry to interrupt you, Webby, but the, the what comes to mind is that Cologne game. Uh, those fans were uh, insane uh, playing the Oilers there. That was crazy. Yeah, and it was nonstop from start to finish. It literally was nonstop. I guess you guys probably hear anybody that wanted to watch. You see the end zones, they stayed standing. There's one little group, unique area at the end behind both goalies that they stay standing the absolute whole game. They're chanting literally the whole game. They're getting the crowds going. So it's, uh, it's I don't know if it's just uh, standard there or how they've always been like that, but it was basically it was packed. Like, it was packed for warm ups uh, for those games. Both those games that were over there at that time were both packed for warm ups. Webby, what, what's the. I mean, this maybe this is a dumb question, but are you, as the NHL, are you guys seeing a benefit? I know you're working for the PA, but are you, are, is the NHL, is the PA seeing a true benefit from playing these games over in Europe? Like, is it, is it worth it to, to drag the guys all over there and, and have them in different time zones? And I think 20 years ago, it might have been a little bit of a different story, even 25 years ago, and they probably started going over there. I don't they've been going over there uh, a long time, even prior to when I started playing uh, or was playing. But, um, yeah, I think back then you didn't have the uh, the outlets. You didn't have the streaming games. You didn't have, you know, NHL.com uh, available to, uh, you know, NHL Network to tap into to watch the games that are going on over here and watch your favorite players from your home country playing in North America um, and uh, doing great jobs. But I think the, the environment definitely has changed. I mean, with the uh, with the technology that's been applied, and so I think there's probably more of an opportunity now, more of an upside. I think it's probably too really too early to actually gauge. You know what I mean what that upside potentially could be, but uh, you definitely uh, you hope to see that there's going to be a little tick uh, upward in the uh, you know in any in any capacity that can actually measure. Now you're also in China. You're in Beijing and uh, some other places over there. Have they has the NHL got a foothold there yet? No, way too early there. That's like, you're talking like a hockey, you know what I mean? Scandinavian hour, you know, hockey central. 
they, they've been producing, you know, stars of our game for for generations, and now we go over to China, which is uh, about to, you know, is on the brink of, you know, starting, you know, um, basically uh, competing in their first Olympics in a couple of years, in Beijing there in, in 22, and so you know, it's a different, different, they're in a different position than uh, than we are in the, uh, the in Europe there. So it's it's definitely brand new. It's got a huge potential to grow there, and in the size of the uh, population, of course, uh, you see the probably you see the potential there. And then you also see the amount of facilities that are starting to go up over there. Yeah, arenas are popping up everywhere, and Wainers getting involved. Yeah, they've uh, they've caught some attention, right? If you got guys like Wayne Gretzky heading over there and uh, putting on uh, clinics and, and going around and, and really just kind of being a great ambassador of the game and trying to grow the game. And then uh, there's a lot of North Americans that are heading their way uh, over to China to help uh, develop the game over there. And again, they uh, they're they're already, they're already looking at what they're going to look like in the Beijing Olympics. They're already trying to figure out how that whole process is going to go. And I think it's going to be uh, probably the start of something, but it's going to be a very long road over there. There's still a lot of work to do. Do you, do from the I know you can't make an official statement or anything like just your personal opinion. Do you feel like the league and the players want to be in China for 2022? Oh well, I can't make any uh, you know any statements on behalf of the uh, the uh, the ownership in the NHL, but I know for a fact that the players um, are very disappointed not being able to be in uh, South Korea, and you know they they definitely want to be participate and be involved and, and, and celebrate the Olympics and participate on behalf of their countries and be around all the other athletes while they participated. And then uh, we're definitely going to have to hash that out in the near future. But the, uh, the definitely the NHL players want to uh, want to participate. It's something they've dreamed about. You know, these, a lot of these kids, these guys now, will actually grow up and they don't they don't know anything different other than to watch the NHL players in the Olympics. Whereas that wasn't that was not the way it was when we grew up. You know what I mean? It wasn't until we started playing in '98 there that um, that was the first taste of it. And but these kids, have, that's all they've ever watched growing up is every four years watching the best players in the world participate on the uh, the biggest stage. What's the end game in China to sell merchandise or to have a, a player that uh, is from China and become a star in the NHL or both? <laughs> all of the above. Uh, you know what I mean? It's uh, it would be nice to to get that to get that athlete there, but talk with the NBA and you know what I mean how long they've been over there before they got their big brand, the big name player coming out of there, Yao Ming, and uh, they've been uh, they're over there thirty years now, right? And it was not just like they just showed up Yao Ming and all of a sudden the NBA went there. They were actually there, boots on the ground for for many years prior to ever having uh, some type of success like that. So. It's definitely uh, it's, it's it's a long road. It's a long, gradual road. It's not going to see uh, big spikes like everybody maybe expects it to be, just because it's China and the infrastructure they want to build there. But it's going to still take a long time. Uh, going back to your career, Webby, O2 Salt Lake City. Were you surprised not to get the call for the Canadian Olympic team? Yeah, I was close. <laughs> you know, I know they're looking for that kind of style out there for the Olympics, you know, uh, but. Uh, I still, I definitely had my, um, I did have my, uh, my flights booked though. I was out of there. <laughs> hey, Webby, there's a Pete's alumni game coming up. Are you going to be showing up for it? Um, after my trip for uh, 30 days, uh, I think I'm going to stay put here in, in Long Island, uh, spend some time with the family. Can I impersonate you? You definitely can. 100%. <laughs> it wouldn't be that hard. I just play a lot of games there. Uh, now, you, you do live on Long Island. Uh, Dan and I are obsessed with these videos of Keith Hernandez on Long Island going out and getting his paper every day with his cat and everything. Uh, uh, do you ever run into Keith uh, at the local uh, McDonald's uh, just wandering around with his mustache? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen him at a few events here and there, but I definitely don't uh, see him with the cats. I have not seen the videos yet, actually. I have seen a bunch of commercials uh, with him in it, but I have not seen the uh, the ones with the cats. And have you found my swim trunks that uh, are somewhere in your house? No, I do. I do have your swim trunks. You do? Oh, I do. Good. Okay. So I, I lost I lost my license. I, I'll, I'll save for next year. I lost my license at the U.S. Open. They sent it to me, and now I found my trunks. I've got everything back. Yes, so you were you were a train wreck. <laughs> well, that's kind of standard, isn't it, Webby? And and how did you please tell me you used a pair of like barbecue tongs to touch the <laughs> the swim trunks? Tell you the truth, I didn't find them. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, well, we squeezed it in, Webby. You're off the hook for next Monday. Webby, this is great. Oh, I appreciate that. I'm glad you could fit me in. Uh, thanks for coming on, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. All right, guys. Have a good one. See Bye. you, Webby. That's uh, former Islanders great Steve Webb, friend of the podcast. And, um, wow, we uh, packed a lot in. It's a lot a lot of podcasts uh, for one podcast. I hope everyone really enjoyed it. But you and know what? Drew, as this happened, Drew Brees became the NFL's all-time passing leader. And it's Thanksgiving, so that's us giving thanks to the listeners by giving you more. We filled your plate. Wow. A lot of metaphors. And if you haven't had a leftover turkey sandwich, please send it in the mail. Send it to Dan. Uh, or what, some leftover nachos. What's our address send again? Send those to Ariel. Downtown Scarborough. Downtown Scarborough across from the mall. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week. See you.